colleagues, dear friends, these big 1,500 people, liberal family in Europe. I'm actually very happy and privileged to be here to talk to you today because apart from being president of Liberal International, I was for many years a foreign minister of a small European nation, Andorra, and therefore, as a European, I like to talk also to my constituency. First of all, let me thank Hans van Balen, the president of ALDE and a former president of Liber International. With him, the cooperation between ALDE and Liber International has been excellent. We have worked uh, very closely together, and we actually made possible the Liberal Manifesto of Liberal International uh, together. It's been a work of many years, and I want to thank him wholeheartedly. Now, this is what I'm going to talk to you about tonight, the Liberal International Andorra Manifesto. It's a manifesto that uh, was uh, uh, finished in the Congress of Liberal International in my home country of Andorra recently. It's uh, being translated now in as many languages as we have parties, and we have about 100 parties, probably a few lang languages or maybe more. But uh, today I heard that it's been translated already into Dutch, so very soon uh, it's going to be available in the Netherlands. Um, it's been an effort through many continents uh, in this past two, three years, and also with the help of the Friedrich Naumann Foundation and the drafting committee presiding by Dr. Karl-Heinz Paquet, who's done an amazingly good job. We're very grateful, and I want to thank him publicly here today. This adventure took us to Berlin, Oxford, Taipei, Marrakesh, Santa Cruz de la Sierra, Mexico, Bangkok, Dakar, Andorra, and many other places. It's been exhausting, but very rewarding. And why has it been so rewarding? Because, and validated, of course, by our leaders, prime ministers, presidents, uh, heads of state, heads of government, of uh, uh, liberals that we have met in New York at the UN General Assembly. It's been very rewarding because we have come to a document that it was not easy, it was not easy at the beginning, that actually synthesizes the essence of liberalism in the 21st century, now in 2017, takes stock of what we've done in the past, and also looks quite well into the future, and takes into account the different sensibilities. Now, Liberal International, when it started in 1947, was an organization that was mainly and basically European. I can tell you now, we are everywhere. We are in Africa. Uh, we are going to have the next Congress in uh, Dakar, in Senegal. We had the momentous one in Abidjan. We are, of course, in Latin America with a lot of think tanks, uh, not as many parties in Latin America, but a lot of think tanks, a lot of intellectual thinking for liberalism in Latin America. We are in Asia, where we're doing quite a, a good job um, holding the fort, for example, in Taiwan, you know, a very democratic society where our president, uh, Dr. Tsai, basically is now ruling with her party, the DPP, but also like uh, in uh, Thailand, where our member party has uh, had to uh, resist all these years now and the military um, uh, control of the country. We are in uh, 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 Europe. Uh, of course, we've heard of the strength in Europe. I've heard Guy Verhofstadt talk about, you know, being the second largest group in two years, uh, probably in Europe, in the European Parliament. And we are basically everywhere. And bringing together these sensibilities has not been easy. For example, one issue, individual rights, collective rights. This was quite a complicated thing to put together because of of course, the visions also among liberals in the Western world, but also the visions between the Western world and some of the liberals from the developing countries who come from very different traditions and cultures, but at the same time, who are truly liberal in the core values that they espouse. So let me tell you a little bit about this um, manifesto and how it can be useful to ALDE, particularly now that there's the effort done by uh, Tavi Roivas and the drafting group of ALDE for the manifesto to draft a, it's a different exercise, it's a manifesto for the elections in Europe, but it's nevertheless a manifesto that will draw, I believe and I think and I hope, from what we've done in terms of our vision for liberals in the 21st century. We start basically with the vision, right? Human progress in a free world, we realize that uh, in the past 70, 80 years, since the end of World War II and the foundation of Liberal International and the propagation of liberal values, we did relatively well in terms of like, you know, pushing for liberal values. We've done relatively well in creating 
an, an amazing amount of wealth for the world in, in areas that we never even believed uh, before. Uh, and also in pushing for um, human reason, the foundation for progress towards a better world, we believe. Liberalism, we say, is dedicated to the inalienable right of all people to a life in which each can determine how they wish to live. We see people as liberals, as self-governing agents, independent authors of their own lives. We also understand that there's a comprehensive set of rights, freedoms and responsibilities that allow for the pluralism of beliefs and ideas, as well as the diversity in backgrounds that nourish this richness of difference without distinction based on gender, race, age, sexual orientation, religious beliefs, disability, or any other personal or social condition. We say that the liberal society is based not only on human rights, but on human relationships. And in order to protect liberal institutions, which operate under the rule of law, uh, we want to promote equal opportunities for everyone. Now, this is the vision, human progress based on reason. Now, we see also that right now, in this past decade or so, there's been a rise in new threats to freedom. And where do we identify these threats to freedom coming from? From authoritarianism, populism, and fundamentalism. And these three isms, basically, feed on the suspicion that rising inequalities of power and wealth are preventing the liberal social law contract from delivering fair opportunities for those who are most disadvantaged. The ability and effectiveness of the institutions of the liberal world order to meet the challenges of climate change, a growing world population, and increasing migration are also being questioned. The growing heterogeneity of many societies is cause for insecurity for many people, and this exacerbates the attachment of many people to what they perceive as the, their core identity. We talked today about several identities, how liberals we see these different identities that people can have, but they cling to a core identity when they fear that everything else is attacked. So how do we respond through this vision and with these challenges that we have? Our response is basically opportunities for everyone, progress for all, and we articulate basically this response as a, an ideology that has been able throughout its existence of adapting quite well to changing environments. We want to be inclusive, we want to be equitable, um, and we want to basically do what liberals do best, which is basically promote human progress through 10 points. And I'm going to go quickly through them. Promote equal rights for all and defend human rights uh, worldwide. Um, we see that attack. I've been traveling a lot, as I told you, as president of Liberal International. We see it in Venezuela, for example, in Latin America, where populism now of the left is being, you know, uh, 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 is threatening the well-being, the literal well-being of that country. We've seen that also in populisms of the right in the continent, in Asia, in Thailand, in Myanmar, the crisis in Myanmar, which worries us very much. In Taiwan, China. China has such a huge number of people. It's such an important country, both in history and in the world. We really need to pay a lot of attention to China. What happens in China, what kind of model develops in China, will influence a lot of the world, particularly in Asia, but also elsewhere, in Africa and elsewhere. And we really need to pay attention to what happens there. In Europe, of course, you know, the organs of this world, the urbans of this world, in Russia, um, in Africa. Um, we have a new Secretary General uh, from the DA, from the Democratic Alliance, a party that is actually fighting against the entrenchment of the ANC in South Africa. So, basically, looking for human rights, for all. Human rights, of course, for everybody, individual rights. Rights also for the LGBT community, rights for women. Uh, too many times relegated uh, to the back or seen as secondary rights. These are primary rights. These are rights that need to be affirmed everywhere as universal rights. They cannot just be cultural rights or rights depending on the culture. These are things that we have to stand on principle for. Um, we talk about refugees. Refugees is a, an interesting point. Today we had this debate, it was a real debate. We liberals do have real debates in our political congresses between Mark Rutte, for example, and Nicola Baer, in which they had, if not different, at least 
alternative visions of how Europe could respond to the refugee crisis. Well, we talk about the root causes of the refugee crisis. Um, we say, of course, that we need to uh, welcome uh, refugees. It is clear to us that asylum is the responsibility of the international community as a whole. We are an open ideology. At the same time, we recognize, liberal societies recognize, the responsibility to help identify and fight the root causes of people fleeing their home countries. So basically, we bring together the two arguments that we ha heard today from Nick Lobert and Mark Rutte. Second point, strengthen democratic institutions, the rule of law and civil society. I will not go through it too much because that's a very core uh, sentiment of liberals and we can find it already in the Oxford Manifesto and it's of course retaken in the Andorra Manifesto. Defend freedom of information, expression and the media and the right to privacy. And the right to privacy here is quite important because this is a new phenomenon in the world with the exponential increase in information gathering and storage made possible with new technologies, we are determined to ensure that a rules-based framework guarantees the integrity of individual private data, online privacy, and freedom from surveillance, and the right to redress where citizens are harmed by breaches of privacy or targeted misinformation, regardless of the medium of communication. In order to provide the media and general public also with the ability to control public Authorities, it is crucial to ensure access to information regarding the affairs of public and democratic institutions at all levels. Accountability, which basically is what fights uh, fake news, or this idea of fake news that is now <laughs> taking hold and being used by people who actually generate those, those same fake news. Number four, foster, extend, and promote education. Now, I said before that one of the principles and one of the definitions of the word liberal is, of course, freedom, but also liberality at its origin. A lot of our opponents want to define liberals as people who only care for the selfishness, basically, of the invisible hand. And starting even with Adam Smith, that is not true. What Adam Smith and others talk about is also of this responsibility towards society. And education and health are essential components for equality of opportunity in a liberal society. And this is why these are po uh, point number four and point number five of the Liberal Manifesto of 2017. Um, the best guarantor of equality of opportunity for us is a high quality education to all, irrespective of social or economic background. The acquisition of skills, of course, but also the acquisition of critical thinking from early childhood and throughout the rest of one person's lifetime and also promoting, through education, tolerance, human rights, and the application of differences in perspective. I also heard uh, Mr. Linder from Germany today talk about the German campaign and the emphasis they put on education. And I think here we have this new look at liberalism that innovative parties are actually like taking forward right now. Deliver the best access to health care for illness and disability, number uh, five. Um, this, of course, is important on humanitarian grounds, but also uh, because it's a major obstacle, bad health, to economic development. And then we, we recognize the development of a, a new form or a new issue that has taken prominence, which is the issue of uh, uh, mental illness and the disparities that exist in the world. In a world in which we have expanding technology and e-medicine and whatnot, we have in other places still in 2017, no access to drinkable water and sanitation. These, of course, are responsibilities that we have as liberals. Secure the sustainability of global work, uh, world growth. Of course, this was going to be one point at the beginning when we started discussing the issue. It was brought up very much in Asia, I remember, in many developing countries. The issue, of course, of economic growth being sustainable environmentally, fiscally, and uh, socially and uh, particularly the issue of uh, climate change, which is, for us, the greatest environmental threat humanity knows and therefore trumps many other issues that we need to look at and look at in our programs uh, in the future. And also a demand very clearly from parties from a lot of the countries in developing uh, parts of the world. Now, number seven, promote technological advances and fight abuses. Um, now, we regard, of course, as liberals, the creativity of humankind as potentially limit unlimited. We are not afraid of technological change. 
It happens. We have to deal with it, and we have to deal with it intelligently. Rapid scientific discoveries, digitalization, biotechnology, artificial intelligence will create vast opportunities, but also vast challenges for humanity. And uh, of course, we want to make sure that this is not used for war and armament. Uh, as liberals, we are people that are committed to peace and to the international order, because we are liberals, those who created the international order after World War II to try to like, you know, create a new kind of earth, basically, with the United Nations and whatnot. And uh, um, we want to make sure that we prevent the abuses, well-defined abuses, of technological advances, um, but also not hinder the process of scientific discovery, research, and individual development. Number eight, support, trade, and investment. Um, we see the reappearance, of course, of protectionist attitudes. It has to do with that sense of core identity, of being threatened, etc. And, uh, um, of course, the sense that some countries are being left out of the benefits from a liberalized world economy. We have seen, if we look at the numbers, such an increase in wealth and development in many parts of the world, in Asia primarily, that all the numbers of the world are very good in 2017 economic uh, development. But of course, in a lot of the countries that developed first, there's a lot of fear that a lot of displacement, and somewhat justified, um, has happened, and that some pain is coming. And that creates and helps, uh, gives root to all these populisms that we see in our uh, Western world. So we are committed to international trade, we are committed to the World Trade Organization uh, and the rules of the World Trade Organization, and uh, we want to resist these uh, siren calls of economic protectionism. And then number nine, support, control, migration. That was a tough one. That was a tough one because the idea of migration from the of member parties of Liberal International from Western Europe or from uh, North America or from you know, the developing world are particularly, particularly different. And um, we are, of course, as liberals, though, committed to um, opening. We're not people that are committing to closing and staying in our own part of the world. People want to move. They've done that, you know, from the beginning of time to better themselves, to better their families, and that we will not um, stop. And in Europe, basically, we need to come up with certain ways of actually providing a framework for control migration. And this is where um, our, I wouldn't say as developed, num point number nine, wants to uh, go to basically provide or help provide that framework. And finally, strengthen international peace and cooperation. We are the political parties that believe in international cooperation. We believe in peace. We believe in the international system. My reforms might have happened. But in the end, if we look also at indicators, what happened, for example, with the Millennium Goals of the United Nations. I was ambassador to the UN for quite a few years. Yeah, a lot of people criticized the United Nations. But from 2000 to 2015, in which we applied the Millennium Goals, the Millennium Goals, which were quite far-reaching in 2000, and everybody said we will never get there, if we look at the numbers of 2015, we got in many, many areas there. So the international community is not, maybe for resolving conflict, we have still a, quite a few problems in getting together. But for a lot of the achievements of development, we need to protect and continue protecting the international community. And in these, we finish, of course, our manifesto with our commitment to the responsibility to protect as endorsed by the United Nations in 2005. Now, this is our international liberal manifesto, the Andorra Manifesto of 2017. It's up to you, it's up for grabs. I give it to uh, Tavi, um, and we are ready, of course, to cooperate with ALDE in anything you might want. We will, of course, now start an implementation plan of the manifesto for the next few years through Liberal International on the help of the Friedrich Norman Foundation. Thank you very much. Please welcome on the stage Tavi Roivas, Chair of the Older Party Manifesto Drafting Committee. You got to love that music, don't you? 
Dear friends, uh, some of you know that uh, I, like several others of us, grew up in a country that was for five decades occupied. And this means generations without freedom of speech, freedom of political choice, freedom of uh, travel and trade, without freedom of uh, doing basically anything that is considered to be out of box. And this background gives me and many others of us immense urge to do our part in making the world we live in different, making it better, making it more free. We have gone a long way since uh, the time, obviously, and uh, we don't have any iron curtain. We have a Europe that is much more free than it used to be just 26 years ago. But let's be honest, our task is not complete. Every day we can see liberal values and principles challenged. We can see them challenged in Europe. We can uh, see them challenged in um, many countries um, further uh, from us. We will see populism, protectionism, racism, homophobia, gender inequality, and unfortunately I could go on and on and on with this uh, list. And it might be tempting for um, any politician who is um, seeking for uh, short-time fame and popularity to trick voters to go for easy solutions. This has been trending in almost all of our countries, uh, and not only recently. But as ever tempting as easy solutions for complex problems are, populism, my friends, is never the right answer. Neither is uh, protectionism, uh, which is um, trying to tear apart the unity that uh, we and our generations before us have worked so hard uh, to build. So, our task as liberals designing the society of our time and beyond must continue. Does anyone in the room oppose to that? Great. So, <laughs> the task of the Man uh, Manifesto Committee is easy. Liberals have 100% consensus on important things, right? Um, all we have to do is uh, rephrase the liberal values. We have to find the most important liberal uh, um, answers to all the challenges that are ahead of EU. And um, as a small thing, we also have to make the text interesting enough so that people will actually read it. And, um, yeah, I almost forgot to mention that it also has to help each and every one of your parties to win the elections uh, at your home, uh, home countries. So, as I said, it is an easy task like a work in the park or a run in the banks of Amstel's, if you uh, prefer. Dear friends, uh, I want to thank uh, the Bureau, the Council, and first and foremost, each and every one of you to put this trust in us. I was indeed um, trying to make a joke while I was saying that this is an easy task. I'm not insane yet. I do understand that uh, this is a huge challenge, but who has ever said that life should be easy? And uh, it goes without saying that nothing in this world is impossible if you have a great team. And we do have a great team, indeed. Uh, we have uh, Anders for Grasmus, uh, Nick Clegg, Anna Berner, just to mention a few names that don't need any introduction, neither in this group nor outside that. We have um, members of parties around Europe who have invested their time, invested their energy to contribute to make this manifesto really a winner for all of us. 
and as a more important winner for Europe and, and to create a better and more free Europe for all of us. Now, the, our first task as the Manifesto Committee is not to write. Our first task is to listen, to listen to all of you, to listen to your parties, what is important for you to win the elections, but more importantly, of course, what is important as you consider it to make Europe more liberal. And we will um, invest a lot of time and effort to that. Um, and when we said that uh, the manifesto process will be inclusive, we actually meant that. If you take the ALDE Congress app, I hope uh, every one of you has downloaded it already. Now is about time, if you haven't. Um, the Congress is almost over, so you still have a few hours to do that. You will find my personal email and my direct cell phone number there. So I'm counting on you to actually contact me and tell me what do you think should be in the manifesto. I believe that uh, this is the only way we can have a manifesto that next Congress will vote for and will approve as all of our own. Dear friends, uh, I really am immensely proud to be part of this great team um, working for the manifesto. And as I said, I'm counting also on your contribution and support. Let us work together for more liberal Europe. Thank you very much.